and welcome back to another episode of Watching Ball Like a Ball Player. What did you think of that? Pretty cool, huh? Just a couple YouTube videos and I figured out how to do this. So, all right, well, we are back for Texas A&M at number eight, Texas. So a big, uh, big, former Big 12 in Texas A&M, Big 12 Texas. So obviously a really big rivalry game. Looks like they have a really good crowd here. So should be an exciting game to watch. Now, I need you guys to get on and pick some games that you want me to do. Um, I've actually made the decision that I'm going to do two a week because I like doing these so much. I have a lot of fun doing these. So I'm going to do two a week. So please, you know, uh, recommend a game for me to to break down and because they're typically on YouTube here where we can watch them and do this. So without further ado, let's dive into this ball game and watch some baseball like a baseball player. Here we go. It's time to go, and this crowd is ready to react. The senior Sounds like a good crowd. Booth. Ah, from Queen Creek, Arizona steps in, first pitch of the game. 94, midweek. Balls will be an adventure. That's crazy. Tried to aim that one, and it leads Walking the leadoff guy never works. The payoff. There goes the runner. What I tell you, he's going to score on that. So that's a good relay. Um, outstanding job, obviously, from the uh, base runner's part. He, The second he was stealing and saw that ball get down the line, he knew that he was scoring or at least going to try to score. Um, Texas did nothing wrong there. It was just unfortunate for them that Texas A&M hit the ball right down the line. But that's a really good, good piece of hitting, good piece of base running, and also good relay. So... That's one way to start when you're at your rival's home park. No outs top of the first. The 0-2, there goes the runner. This ball hit pretty well to right. It's down for a base Jeez. hit. And Rock will score easily. 2-0, Texas A&M jumps out in front. Being really aggressive on the base the pass. Some good two-strike hitting. Now Texas has it going. So these two midweek starters are low to mid 90s. And remember, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are typically the best starters. And then the midweek guys are, are the fourth, fifth starters. Uh, and these teams, fourth and fifth starters are in the mid 90s, which is pretty nuts. And again, for you pitchers out there, you gotta be aware of that. If you wanna play at a play at school like this, most of their pitchers have velocity Pretty close or equivalent to these guys, if not more. Squares to Buck, puts it down. Nice. Has it, comes up with it oh, I love it. I love it. Defense. So that would be what we call a sack drag. So let's go back and watch this. Now, what is a sack drag? Remember, um, when I say drag, I'm talking about anything that we bunt for a hit on the third base side. So you can see here, he's squaring relatively late. A sack drag is for our guys that are really good bunters and they can run. And here's what a sack drag is. A sack drag is a later square, a later show bunt than we normally would on a uh, sack bunt. So we're not letting the defense know. Pretty much the purpose is we're going to keep the defense back in their position and then I'm going to square late, but I'm going to make sure that I miss middle. We always talk about we miss middle of the field on a sack bunt and we miss foul on a drag bunt or a bunt for a hit. Why do we do that? We miss middle because the goal isn't, the priority isn't to get a hit. The priority on a sack bunt is to move up the runner. Now we're not, when I say middle, I'm not saying straight back to the pitcher, but we're not missing foul on a sack bunt. On a drag bunt, we miss, we miss foul because if I bunt, bunt it into the field, we're typically going to be out almost every single time. So he was able to bunt to the third base side here because he squared late. Um, but his priority was to sacrifice himself and get a sack bunt down. That's why he kind of missed towards the middle of the field. But since it was kind of late, it worked out and it was just a pretty well-placed bunt. So that's what a sack drag is. It's in between a 
sack bunt and a drag bunt. But the priority is the sacrifice. Um, this was the first pitch of the at bat for guys, again, guys that are good bunters and they can run. These are the guys I give sack drag to, or that usually will sack drag. And if they miss the first one, the next one just turns into a straight sacrifice. We're not going to try to be quick on both of them. They already know we're going to try to bunt. So if you miss the first sack drag, the second pitch with one strike turns into just a straight sacrifice. Bunt, See, this, this would be missing middle of the field. That's what I'm talking about. That's where the bunt should go. We don't want it on the line because we're sacrificing. Then we bunt it foul and, and, and we don't get the job done. So that's a great job. Comes up with it, throw the first nine. I wonder if they bunt again, first and second, no outs. Probably not with their free hitter. Yeah, not with this dude. He rakes. Pretty exciting game so far, holy heck. Good crowd. Hmm. Shortstop always looking for another out. I, most high school kids I see on a play like this, they just kind of jog over and pick the ball up. This guy knows that, you know, the runner's coming in hard to third base. There's a chance that he, he takes a step around the bag. Just looking for that extra out. It was also a four star. He just couldn't go there quick enough. Would be an athlete. Pitcher's priority there obviously was to get the out at home. So I'm I'm okay with running at home and kind of flipping it if that's where your the the ground ball is taking you when you catch it. Um, but that took a long time, and because of that, the catcher really tried to rush his throw, which he should have just shut it down there. He really tried to, to throw the crap out of it and get that double play at first base. But when it take, the ball takes that long to get to you, the smart play a lot of times is to just shut it down. Maybe pump fake and then look for the next out, but he tried to force that, and obviously it didn't work out. Threw it into the back of the runner. Looked like. Speed on the ground. Inside nice play. So, super high pressure play right there. Um, that was, he just missed a, a, a ball. Now, granted, it was absolutely drilled at him. Um, but that's in his head. He just missed the ball. They have some, you know, it could have been an out, a play that uh, a play, third baseman at this level should make. And with two outs, runners on second and third. He's got to make a really aggressive play and go get a ball and, and get it out. If he misses this ball, two runs. If he throws it away, two runs. If he makes the play, no runs. So a lot of pressure on this one in a tie ball game in the first. And he does a good job. And you know why he was able to make that play? Because he's done it 100,000 times at practice. We're putting that third baseman to work. With a stand up double. So there's no double cut on that one. No double cut. Let's talk about why. You know, what this second baseman is reading is where this, this left fielder is going to be able to get the ball. Um, that ball did not make it the whole way to the wall, so he's kind of just hanging there to see if his left fielder can cut it off. And uh, because it didn't make it to the wall, he just had to hang back at second base and, and that kid was never going to be able to go third because the ball didn't make it to the wall. So that's why there's no double cut there. The shortstop just filters over to line up for third base. Popped up. Wynn's going to carry this out. I think it's going to be deep. See him get behind the ball. He did not get behind the ball at all. So, you know, sometimes you make a bad read and you catch the ball on your heels a little bit because you're too far forward. Um, I don't, 
I, I mean, we just saw him throw the ball. It didn't look like his arm was anything special. So throw, he's probably not throwing a guy out from that position, but we should still always be getting behind the ball. Runners at third base, if it's a, if it's a borderline sacrifice fly or a borderline ball that we can tag up on, then we are reading how the outfielder catches the ball, and that's what we, how we determine if we tag and go home or if we stay put. So we're reading how that outfielder catches the ball. Obviously, a no-brainer on this one. He's deep, and he catches it on his heels. But um, let's just say this ball was hit you know, 15 yards in, or maybe not even that far. But something where you kind of have to think about it, whether you're going to tag or not, we're reading how he catches that ball. That's, that's going to determine if we tag or not. Tags, no play at the plate, and the Longhorns have the lead. That's a real Texan right there, Mullet. That hitting. He is always a threat to run, not run. This ball hit pretty well to left. It's got up into the breeze. Jeez. Back to the wall. This ball's gone. I'm going to say that it had to be a little bit windy, dude, because that was kind of a slice through its swing, and it carried out the left center. Pretty strong kids. Yeah, he's kind of out front a little bit. Just, kept going. just got it up in the wind and it kept going. It looked like he knew it was gone, though. I don't know. <laughs> Single his first time up, and he is just a hit machine. Lead off base Hard side. around the bag, always. Almost every single single you see from these high-level college players. They're going to get Faltini mm -hmm. in a pickle. He's going back to second. He's done a good job here. That good scout scholar back to second. He's out. He did. This is a brief history of B&H. Everyone's favorite photo and video star. And him time, you're going to get a pickle. So let's talk about this one here. This is a hit machine. So, ball's hit, obviously, in front of this runner right here. So, he should not be going. Now, if that ball, that ground ball, is taking the shortstop up in front of the line, which this one obviously is not, then we can move as a runner on second base. But because that ball's behind him and he's moving towards third base, you can see the third baseman's already filtering back to third base. Um, just the interesting decision a wrong decision by this runner on second so easy play for that shortstop to just catch the ball and and get him in a little run down here so notice here ball is out of his glove he's running the runner at a quick pace like he's running fast he wants to make this runner make a decision if we're moving slow that runner can just be shuffling back and forth then we're in a run down all day and all all we're doing is waiting until we make a mistake and throw the ball away and give this guy the base. So we want to be one to two throws in a rundown and we're out of it. Now watch the second baseman right here. As he start calls for this ball, I don't know if they have a verbal or their hands or whatever their, their, their call is, but he's on the inside of this runner. He's on the inside of this runner on his arm side. And as he calls for that ball, he cuts the distance, right? So he's not standing on the bag waiting for this third baseman to throw him the ball. And notice, as soon as you throw this ball, we got to get out of the way. If this runner turned to the inside and he wasn't getting out of the way and he runs into the, the defender, he gets the next bag for obstruction. So as a runner, we're always looking to run into somebody. I'm not saying truck stick them and put them in the dirt. I'm just saying make contact with them and do a little LeBron James flop on the ground. And then when they tag you out, as long as you're moving back to third base or whatever direction you were going, um, then you're going to be safe. So always looking for a runner to just bump into and fall over. Okay. 
He's done a good job here. That gets Scouter back to second. He's out. You see that runner that hit the ball is on, on second base. We have to be move up into scoring position when our teammates in a run now. This ball ripped into left field. 96. For a two out single. They're into the bullpen now. Fifth hit of the night for Texas AM. Some of them wanted to stay it's behind the mound. And this ball misses inside. It ended up being about a 75 foot throw. Missed. Mm. Through a load of bases. 95 96. Don't matter if you're not in the zone. Oh, is that going to get out? There's the wind. Whew. And why'd that happen? Okay, let's not focus on the one pitch that he threw that we hit, hit out. Let's focus on the pitches before and the at bats before. He just hit a grand slam because we walked guys, we were getting behind everybody, and then we make one mistake. So, walks, errors, free bases in general are what turns mistakes into runs for the other team as far as from a pitching perspective, right? If we make them earn their bases and earn it to get on base, which typically means they're not getting on bases often, now we make a mistake, it doesn't hurt as bad. But when we give them free bases, walk a couple guys, load the bases, now one mistake really, really hurts. That turns it from a tie ball game into 8-4. Horns down. I can't believe how many guys are doing that this year. <laughs> I think it's a penalty, personal foul, 15-yard penalty in football if you do that. Just out over the plate. That's Got crazy. Barreled it up. Once it gets up in the breeze, there's no... I know there's wind there. First career grand slam. It's a right hitter up and throwing in the Texas book. And this into left field. So as a pitcher defense, after we score runs, we're always looking for a shutdown inning. Shutdown inning... Really, here's how you get a shutdown inning. You attack the first guy and get him out. Now, if he gets a base hit, he gets a base hit. But so many times I've seen guys with, um, we score a bunch of runs, so we're in the dugout for a while. Our pitcher comes out and walks the first guy. And we're like, this is exactly how you give another team life. We don't want to give another team life. We want to score a bunch of runs, come in and shut them down for an inning, and that changes the momentum completely. Even though they, they're up four runs now, if Texas can just manage to get one run here, that keeps you alive, that keeps the dugout alive, that keeps everybody alive. So from a pitching perspective, we're just going out and attacking these guys and, again, making them earn it. So you pitchers, notice how deep into the scap he is right here. I know the frame rate isn't great, but that's how you throw hard. And I'm not an expert on it. I have been doing a lot of research on this specifically lately. Uh, Jacob DeGrom's a great example. Really, most major leaguers, they have deep scap retraction when their body starts to turn. And that's what allows your arm to stay healthy for longer. And you're going to throw harder because we're using our body rather than just our arm. So something to think about. Do a little research on it. This ball crushed well. on the field. <laughs> Not a shutdown inning. Now Texas is alive again. Nice. Nice. Off of the air for Trey Falcini. The ball's crushed. If you find exercise hard, you need one of these. All you need is three minutes. And once you try it... Good round around first. The three, two. Rip to left field. She took 97, smoked it through the six hole. So you, you guys can see these velocities. I mean, 93 is the new 90 in college baseball. 100 is the new 96 in Major League Baseball. 
So velocity is increasing, but hitters are getting better too. It used to be guys that threw 96, even I guess it's 10 years ago now since I was playing in college, but um, 10 years ago, guys throwing 96 were elite velocity in college baseball. And now there's every power five team has a, a couple guys that are doing that. So, but the hitters can handle that, which just goes to show that that number is not the most important part. It's the location paired with that number, right? I don't think college coaches are really getting super impressed with a six foot righty throwing 88 anymore. Even with great command, they really have to do something special. Um, you need 92 with command now. So we're, you have to know that when you're setting big goals and aspirations for yourself to play at a school like this, you have to know that, that that's what we're shooting for and that requires a lot of work and dedication to get there and to do it the right way and be healthy to get there. Runners at first and third. The 0-2 fastball ripped in the right. I'm pretty sure he just, that's the guy that hit the home run. A lot of offense in this game with some pitchers that look pretty legit. Now trails nine to six. In the right center. Down. Could be hitting. Give me three. Nope. One, two. To right. Getting pushed down. Can he get there? Diving. Nice play. All right, so I talk to my guys a lot about this, these type of plays. You got to make it important that you get this out, that you save a run from scoring. This is two outs with a runner in scoring position. Okay, so if this ball gets down, it's a run. So as an outfielder, the second you see that ball hit, your one and only thought is, I'm not letting this run score. I'm, and you can see what he did here. He was super aggressive. Right. It was important to him that he Can kept he that run from scoring catch. and he went and made a great play. The right. These guys in games like this don't take always take the safe play is in, in situations like this. Situations are the, are are very important. We got to do this the smart play, but it was really important to him that he didn't let that run score and that mentality, that aggressiveness, that confidence, that's why he's playing on this stage for a school like Texas A&M because that's the type of kid he is, and that's what all you guys need to be striving to be like. Confident, aggressive, you know you're good, you're going to step up, put the team on your back, and make a play. That's what he did in a really big situation and broke his belt. The 1-0. All right. Five for five night. This is going to get down into the that kid must be the, the kid that hit the cycle. Away from Kennedy. And here comes Moss. Is that a triple? Have a day. He's in third base. I think it's Be pretty second. cool to hit for the cycle against your rival at their ballpark. Five for five. Is a cycle. Jack Balls, a single in the first, a homer in the third, single in the fourth, double in the sixth, and right there, a triple. I'm not going to repeat what he probably just said there. <laughs> All laser. Gone. Smoked that one. Getting around the bag. Act like you've done it before. Gritty. No way. Oh. Oh, so that's just kind of bad communication right there. Um, the second baseman, when he sees that kid fall down, coming around second, needs to be screaming at the top of his lungs. The third baseman should know that because the second baseman communicated that with him. 
and then he's relaying that to the cutoff. You can see how surprised the cutoff looked like. What just happened? How was that a close play? So he, he didn't even know that that guy fell down. So that's bad communication. Now I get it. Uh, the home team just hit a, a ball down the line. The crowd is really loud, but that you just got to be that much louder. That left fielder had to have known that he fell down. So as a left fielder, I'm just letting it eat and giving my guy a nice long hop to third base because as long as I just get the ball there, he's going to be out. But that was a slow relay by that shortstop, and they missed an out because of that. So, And that's just a communication thing because this kid clearly, based on his body language, didn't know that was going to happen, which means the third baseman didn't let him know to let it go through, and he just cut it off. Interference? And... Had to be interference. Maybe it was interference. Oh, yeah. So, was, I don't know what the second baseman was doing right there. I guess thinking about going out for the double cut, that is not a double cut situation. And he just went into the baseline for seemingly no reason. So, in this situation, up to six runs for Texas A&M, their job is to just get outs. Who cares if, if a couple runs score? It really doesn't matter. Their job is to just make them earn their extra bases. Um, we're not giving them any free bases. We're not trying to do anything crazy. We're just collecting outs. Six outs in this game is o over. And unless they just start obliterating the ball all over the field, then you're going to get six outs before they score six runs. And giving them extra bases like that is, uh, you know, he was probably going to be safe at third anyway, but... You leave absolutely no doubt in their mind uh, because he's going to be safe because of obstruction or interference anyway. On the ground, right side will get the job done. Just getting out. Just getting out. 95. Uh oh, the wind going to take it. Nice play. Nice play. Those are the outs you need in these situations. That was an absolute missile. <laughs> that dude hits laser beams. That's the second of the game, I think. Game. 12-9. What an offensive game. So this is pretty rare. Texas out hit them. Texas A&M had more errors. And the winning team got out hit and had more errors. That's very rare at this level. Um, I'd like to see the box score and see how many walks Texas had because obviously that grand slam inning, uh, they walked a few guys. So typically free bases are, are equal a win for the, uh, the other team when we give them free bases. So um, that was a pretty fun ball game. A lot of offense, a lot of really good things in there. Um, I think a big takeaway from that is that, number one, pitchers throw really freaking hard now. They throw really hard. And you pitchers have to know that, and you hitters have to know that. So to play at this level, you have to be able to hit that pitching. And to pitch at that level, you have to be able to throw like that and have command. I would think that those starters, they're throwing low to mid-90s. They're not the weekend guys because I would imagine because of a command thing. If you miss middle of the plate with 94 nowadays, that gets hammered. So the command piece has to be there as well. And I'd like to compare those guys to their, their weekend starters and just see what the difference is. Um, and you know what? Maybe they have four absolute stud starters and they can only throw three of them on a weekend. So uh, that's a very good possibility as well. That I don't talk about midweek starters like they're not good. They're just not one of their top threes. Um, and there's, there's usually a reason why they're number four instead of number one, two, or three. So um, 
Guys, keep being uncommon. Keep being leaders on your high school team. I hope you're enjoying watching these. I'm having a ton of fun doing them. So let me know some recommendations for some games that you'd like to see. I'm going to do two a week now, and I might maybe posting one of them on YouTube a week. Uh, but you guys are going to get way more than everybody else would. So keep watching. I appreciate you guys tagging along. And I will see you on episode four of Watching Ball Like a Ball Player.